Uh, again, good uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, AHP's Report on Giving webinar for October. Uh, my name is John Wilson. I'm the Director of Content Marketing at AHP. And we've been doing these Report on Giving webinars every month. Um, up until now, they've been very technical, covering topics like how to prepare and submit your data for the survey or how to access reports in the benchmarking platform. But now, as we move into the last few months of the year, we're able to start taking a little broader look at some of the findings from the 2018 report. So on today's webinar, we will go through some of the top-level results from this year's report. We'll take a look at the high performers, which are the top 25% of survey respondents. And then we're also excited to have two representatives from high-performer organizations on the webinar today, um, Joe Stampy from the Meridian Health Foundation, and Scott Lister from University Hospital Foundation. So a little later in the webinar, they will both share some thoughts about the factors that drive high performance in their organizations, uh, as well as the broader healthcare philanthropy landscape. And you'll be able to submit questions as well. But first of all, I'll turn things over to Mike Eggert to share some of the results from the 2018 report I'm giving. Uh, Mike is vice president at ARI. They're a longtime partner with AHP on the report I'm giving. Uh, Mike and his team help organizations complete the survey every year, then they analyze the data and draft the report itself, and uh, at AHP, we're very grateful for their assistance. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. What we're going to look at here is sort of uh, an overview for the report on giving results. The report on giving uh, itself has not been released. Um, John, I believe you had said that uh, that would be probably like by the end of October or something around there. Um, That's right. Yeah, so we're going to look at a couple of areas here that uh, that will be helpful to sort of uh, concentrate on the the uh, big metrics that people look at. If uh, if you were familiar, I know that there's a number of people probably who um, are not that familiar with the uh, platform as far as the you know what the questions that we ask, but basically we go through and uh, collect the information on, on fundraising revenue, fundraising expenses, and then based on those, um, we are able to develop, develop the metrics that, uh, that everyone uses as far as trying to look at you know, efficiency. So return on investment, cost to raise a dollar, um, net fundraising revenue, um, and of course funds raised per direct FTE. There's also a section of the report that goes into use and distribution of funds. So if an organization was completing the survey and they have the uh, visibility to see that, um, it obviously completes the picture as far as um, here's what we raised and where did it go. Um, and so this year we had, uh, for the USA um, report, we had 210 respondents, which was uh, a 23.6 percent uh, response rate. The, um, the first chart that we're looking at here is um, the report on giving results. So again, these are um, approximate totals. And you can see that um, the numbers um, obviously had historically a, a dip you know, based on the recession back in 08 into 09. And then there's the recovery from that. But as you can see, um, you know, starting in, I would say, fiscal year uh, 2011, you can see that that, that um, figure is already ahead of the 2008 number, which would have been the previous high. And then it's uh, incrementally gone up uh, every year since then. Uh, And the next one we're going to look at here is the um, cost to raise a dollar. Um, this is for um, U.S. And again, historically, you can see that number uh, shoot up in 2008. There was um, uh, actually it started in 2007, I guess. I wasn't even looking at that, but uh, you can see that the it became harder and harder, uh, clearly based on that time frame to um, be efficient raising funds. But, um, you know, it's just 
the cost to raise a dollar is just the commonly used metric. Um, so basically, you just divide the total fundraising expenses by the gross fundraising revenue. Um, it fluctuated um, in the last couple of years, but as you can see, if you were looking back historically here to 2004, uh, for the last three or four years, it's been in that range um, as well. And again, these are median values. Um, same thing with the return on investment. You see the low come in as it, it, it is an inverse um, relationship to the cost to raise a dollar. Um, I'd say from, it looks like before 2009, the um, ROI was near or above $3.50. And then it, the lowest point was in 2010 when it was uh, down to $3.05. But um, much like the cost to raise a dollar, uh, those numbers have gone up and they've sort of plateaued recently, but uh, obviously much healthier than, um, than what we were looking at um, eight or nine years ago. Now I'm just going to go through the same type of just top line information for Canada. And again, for Canada, we had 34 respondents. So the response rate was 25.4%. This shows the um, total funds raised in uh, healthcare institutions in Canada. Um, the um, historical numbers are very similar. We're, we see the drop off um, in 2008 and then the slow recovery in 2009. Uh, looks like um, basically around 2011, um, it was back to a level that was slightly higher than, than before the recession and then uh, not Every year since then, there's been a drop off, it looks like in 2015 and 2014, but the last couple of years have rebounded as well. The um, cost to raise a dollar for Canada, if we're looking at it from um, the perspective of history here, um, again, very similar story. You see the uh, high point, there may have been a slight delay from 2008 to 2009, but these numbers are obviously quite high. And then kind of surprisingly, it, it, it dropped down uh, in 2010, but it's just been sort of a zigzag approach, but much like the, um, the US version of this, although we're still slightly higher, um, but uh, obviously you have to keep in mind that the sample size is um, smaller for Canada, so uh, the fact that it's similar to what we were looking at, uh, you know, 12 to 14 years ago, uh, I think means that uh, at least for the last few years, we're in the same similar pattern, which is good. So there's a return on investment for Canada. Again, um, very similar historical pattern where you can see that the low number hitting in 2009. Um, I would say that the, it does, well, basically it's just, uh, again, it's, an, it, uh, um, it's just an indicator of fundraising efficiency as productivity. So um, I think that the overall numbers are very similar for the last three years for both U.S. and Canada. Okay, now I'm just going to get to the high performers now. We um, collect the data. The, if you're familiar with the report on giving, um, the report shows overall numbers for a number of different categories. The questions that we ask on the platform, um, we ask for, uh, as far as fundraising revenue, all of the major areas, major gifts, um, you know, if there's endowments, um, 
any, any type of area that we can um, categorize as far as raising funds. And based on the expenses that people provide us with, um, if there's enough um, of a breakdown, we're able to show the um, revenue versus expenses in a number of different uh, cross tabulations. So the overall numbers are in the report, but then we also have a section of the report that just focuses on the high performers. Um, and this is um, basically set up uh, to, um, as John mentioned earlier, it's the, it's the top 25% in net fundraising revenue. So for the USA, this year we had 54 high performers that raised more than 12.4 million. Um, at phase, fundraising revenue, the median was about 27.3 million. Uh, the cost raised a dollar was 18 cents, as you can tell from looking at those uh, numbers previously. Uh, that's about six cents lower, six or seven cents lower than the um, U.S. total, and the return on investment uh, is uh, 549. Um, I think the overall or ROI was, um, let's see, in 2018, it's at 403. So again, um, these numbers are are uh, measure of efficiency. So you can see that uh, obviously the cost to raise a dollar and the return on investment are really impressive. Um, this chart just looks at the high performers versus all institutions. And the high performers are on the right here. Um, it's interesting when you look at a, um, at a chart like this to see what the overall versus high performer differences are. You can see that in uh, special events is not something that seems to be emphasized among the high performers. It's not a, it's not a huge part of what their uh, totals are made up from. Um, conversely, the um, major gifts, while it's financial, I mean, it's the second largest behind um, corporate and foundation gifts for um, for the overall participants the um, the number is uh, pretty significantly higher for the um, high performers and I would say that the um, when you're looking at uh, some of these other areas here the good thing is that the other is a very, very low number, um, which means that as far as the survey design, um, we pretty much hit all of the categories, which is good because obviously <laughs> you don't want to have a large number that you really have no idea what, uh, what type of fundraising source that is. And again, this is for Canada. So, um, same criteria. We're just looking at strictly um, net fundraising revenue. Um, we have uh, 10 high performers there. And the um, cost to raise a dollar is 26 cents. Uh, it was 24 cents, I believe, for the um, overall number. And the um, return on investment is, um, let's see, it was 418. So again, um, those numbers are are very good. We have the same graph here. We're just looking at the high performers versus everyone else. Um, a little bit of the same. Um, we have the special events is not as prominent, but uh, not not a huge drop off there. Um, the corporate and foundation gifts is actually um, a larger part of the uh, high performers, and the major gifts is a little bit smaller. But all the numbers actually are relatively similar, I would say.
So that uh, that's kind of an overview of everything. All right. Thanks, Mike. And uh, the full list of high performers will go up uh, next week. AHP will announce the, the list via press release. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we are excited to have two representatives from high-performing organizations on our webinar today. Uh, Joe Stampy is President and Chief Development Officer at Meridian Health Foundation in Neptune, New Jersey. And Scott Lister is Director of Finance at University Hospital Foundation in Edmonton, Alberta. So we have a few initial questions for Joe and Scott, and then uh, after that we'll move to answering questions uh, from those of you on the webinar today. You can submit a question at any time. Just click the little speech bubble uh, on the right side of your screen. And that'll open up the chat panel and you can enter your, uh, your message that way. Uh, so Joe and Scott, thank you both for joining us today. Uh, to start with some context, could you tell us a little bit about your organizations? And Joe, let's start with you and Meridian. Um, so we're an academic and research hospital based in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. We've got about 800 inpatient beds at our site. Um, we serve an area, a land mass about the size of Western Europe, which includes um, all of Northern Alberta, most of Northern Canada, and a little bit of Western Canada. <clears throat> so we're a major brain center, cardiac center, transplant center, we're a level one trauma center, and uh, we do all this um, located in a relatively small market. Edmonton, the metropolitan uh, area for Edmonton is about a million people. Um, so we, we certainly work outside, uh, we fill bigger shoes than, than just our uh, local area. Our organization is about 38 people, um, last year we had gross revenues of, of about a little over 36 million and uh, invested assets of about 138 million. Um, in Canada, this is um, probably one of the, the bigger uh, hospital foundations, certainly not the biggest, but um, it's on the bigger side. And um, we serve just the single site. And last year we transferred um, about 24.3 million uh, to the hospital for research, patient care, uh, equipment, and clinical activities, and that was uh, that was a record year for us, the most most we've ever distributed to uh, to the hospital site. So, um, big things are happening here. And are there, as you've reached high performer status this year, are there one or two key things that you would attribute that success to? We have um, achieved high performer status the last two years, <clears throat> and in those two years, we have um, we've really actually focused on the revenue mix of high performers. Um, so uh, we were looking at historical information for all high performers um, and looking at where they're where they're sourcing their revenue from. Um, we notice, of course, that most, uh, that the largest segment is coming from personal solicitations. So that's where we've been shifting our resources to, and that we've been intentional about this in, over the last two years. I'd say three years, which has led us into high performer status for the last two. Um, and so we've been shifting resources there, and that includes um, hiring more major gift staff versus. Um, staff in other fundraising areas like annual giving or events, uh, putting priority on major gift staff. Um, we've been doing more um, scorecard reporting related to major gift giving and building out, um, <clears throat> building out associated activities. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, building a pipeline of donors that we can feed into our major gift giving activities. And that's been a huge key for us in, in being able to build out the major gift is being able to just have a bigger pool of people to um, prospect from. And uh, we, we feel that looking at these, uh, at these, this sort of ideal mix of revenue, we can achieve two things. We can achieve the most efficient um, revenues, and that's, we think, personal solicitation. 
uh, but we can also uh, kind of have the broadest revenues, make sure that we're getting revenues from each source. And so that's more robust. It's a little bit um, uh, in downturns in the economy, it allows us, it's more defensive and allows us to be a little bit more protective of our, uh, of our investments. So uh, that's what we've been doing over the last few years. Uh, and have you been able to increase staffing as a result of this focus? Yes, absolutely. We've increased our major gift staff. One of the most significant um, resources that we've added is a research manager. And this is somebody that is is spending their time looking at our pipeline of donors of our annual uh, our annual donors and identifying who would be a, a high level prospect for a major gift donor or major gift officer. Uh, to approach, um, but they also look outside of our pipeline uh, into the broader market to see if there's anybody that we can bring into our um, donor base uh, at a major gift level. Um, so we're trying to build both from within and from without, and uh, that's been a major, major uh, addition that's that's really moved us forward. Uh, if we could go back and, and hit the same question first, could you share a little context about uh, about Meridian? Sure. Uh, so uh, the Meridian Health Foundation is actually part of um, Hackensack Meridian Health, uh, which is a 16 hospital health system in uh, New Jersey. Uh, we are the largest uh, health system in New Jersey. Uh, three academic hospitals, uh, two children's hospitals, nine community hospitals, and two rehabilitation hospitals. Uh, we're about a five billion dollar company. Um, the uh, Meridian Health Foundation is uh, left over from the merger between Meridian Health and Hackensack Health Network. Uh, so we are uh, still operating two health foundations um, and uh, in the process of discussing merging those foundations as part of the larger merger. So the Meridian Health Foundation covers seven hospitals uh, we do have six hospital-based foundations and one uh, large um, uh, affiliated foundation parent group, uh, and uh, and that's what our report on uh, giving uh, reflected is our, our total fundraising uh, for our our part of the entity. Um, so last year we we raised in total production uh, about 38.6 million dollars. Um, which, uh, you know, the graph that you showed uh, with the breakout in giving, ours art is very different um, in, in a lot of respects. About 12% of our giving came from uh, uh, public grants, about 11% from planned giving. We only received about 2% from corporate and foundation giving and 4% uh, from annual giving, 8% uh, from special events. Uh, which leads um, us to have about 63% of our total revenue uh, from individual major gifts. Um, so obviously the largest part of our um, operation. And as you think about your success, particularly in the major gift arena, are there a, a couple of factors you can identify that helped you get to that level? I think that, um, in 2017, we continue to really work on our um, gratitude program, uh, engaging our physicians to help us identify grateful patients, uh, work with those grateful patients to uh, engage them in conversations about uh, giving back to the organization. Uh, we also did um, really put a focus knowing that uh, a large, um, the most significant portion of our fundraising was coming from individual major gifts. We did also shift our goal setting for our other areas, annual giving, a special events specifically, um, toward a more major gift focus. So we fine-tuned those, um, those areas uh, to help us identify, cultivate, and solicit more uh, efficiently in the major gift area. So those were really two of the major uh, initiatives that we took on in, in 2017 with, with some very good results. 
for the physician engagement piece, did you have challenges you know, getting physicians to buy in or, or did it go smoothly? Well, for the physicians that we did sit down with and engage with, I think that the conversations were very positive. Uh, but in New Jersey, most of the physicians uh, for our um, that practice at our hospitals are independent physicians. They sometimes practice at more than one hospital. Uh, sometimes they practice at our competitor hospital. So it's sometimes difficult to engage them in a conversation about fundraising. Uh, but the ones that we did uh, engage, they became uh, champions for us uh, and helped us identify. Um, grateful patients. Um, we did notice that there was one gap that we had sometimes as we talk with our physicians. We asked them not to focus on what somebody's capacity to give might be, just, just on the gratitude piece. And they were identifying a number of people that might be better suited for a smaller annual fund gift. So we, we need to tweak that a little bit uh, in the future to make sure we're still engaging those folks uh, and engaging the physicians uh, with follow-up so that they feel that every lead that they give us is followed up on and not just the people with the biggest capacity. So that was one of the challenges we had, um, and, and I think we're making some adjustments uh, in the future for that. Excellent. Um, a question for you both, and uh, we can start with Scott on this one. Scott, as you look ahead to, to 2019, what do you see as, as some of your biggest challenges this upcoming year? I think um, there, it's probably a challenge that we continually see, so nothing that's too different, but it's, as I mentioned, we're in a relatively small market, and um, it's a competition for donors. Um, it's competition for staff members, major gift officers. It's it's really is still feels like a small community. So it's um, it's getting the best staff, best major gift officers that we can uh, on our side, and then working with donors uh, to support our initiatives. And um, and so with that comes building a really compelling case for support, uh, which we're in the midst of working with our hospital site to do. And uh, that's going to be critical to seeing some success um, coming out of uh, or within the next year. Um, it's going to be giving those donors something to really rally behind. And uh, we also here in, in Edmonton, in Alberta, we don't have access to patient names um, or health information. Um, so that's something that we're working with our government on to access and that really we feel limits uh, our abilities to to raise funds and to identify potential donors. Um, so that's something that we're constantly working on and really um, really is a major focus of what uh, what our CEO is doing right now. And Joe, the same question for you. What uh, challenges do you see in the upcoming year? Well, as I alluded to, we, we have uh, recently within the last two and a half years uh, completed a major merger um, which doubled the size of our organization and I think we're still uh, digesting that merger uh, and its impact on fundraising uh, I think will be seen in the next uh, year and a half. Um, we're maintaining two very large uh, separate uh, do not overlap in service area uh, fundraising operations uh, but the two fundraising operations are very different and uh, you know we're running on two different databases and have different moves management systems so i see the the um the opportunity for us to uh, align a little bit more closely to, to harmonize our operations uh, as an opportunity but also a challenge and worry a little bit about losing um, donors uh, because of the time that it will take to, to transition uh, and also staff, uh, because the the great unknown of uh, what the new organizational structure will be. So probably the mergers is first and foremost on my mind. All right, and just before we move on to other questions, just a reminder to everyone on the call, if you have questions uh, for Joe or for Scott, feel free to submit them through the uh, through the chat box at the right of the screen. 
question for Joe. As you you think back over your career, uh, what have you seen as as some of the most significant changes in the healthcare philanthropy landscape, and and how have those affected your organization's performance? Uh, Sure. So so, uh, just my career has spanned uh, 30 years in in fundraising, uh, 16 of which were in higher education uh, before making the transition over to healthcare. And the healthcare and, and higher education uh, fields are are different uh, in that uh, you, you look at a different source for um, your your major donors and major donor support. So so I see that uh, early in my career that shift over from special event focused fundraising to more of a major gift operation being a critical piece of that. Uh, and that obviously in healthcare and and the slides I think you showed will continue uh, as we you know get more sophisticated in healthcare fundraising to that major gift culture uh, and uh, that sustainable major gift culture. But one of the challenges I think will, will come down to uh, sort of priority and goal setting uh, as healthcare, the healthcare industry shifts and maybe we need to shift some of our priorities, uh, be more nimble and agile uh, we are actually acquiring a, a major behavioral health um, facility. Uh, so it will change our priorities of, of what we're fundraising for and goal setting as part of that, of how we um, set goals for the organization, much bigger organizations, need for capital, uh, and how we adapt to building case for support for those um, new challenges in the future. And Scott, a, a similar but a little differently focused question. As you uh, as you look at the horizon and the uh, kind of current and future industry trends, what should healthcare development staff be aware of and, and be working to address right now? I think there's um, two or three items. The first being uh, rooted in demographics and um, with a focus on our major and transformational donors, uh, we're looking at the transfer of of generational wealth, developing relationships with um, the children of our our major and transformational donors, um, but, uh, and also millennials, Gen Y, Gen Xers in general. Um, And I think that's probably something that uh, pretty much everybody in North America is, is looking at. We're um, we're also f- looking out into the future uh, with a focus on accountability, and by this I mean uh, receiving feedback from the hospital, from the doctors, on the impact um, of the gifts that are flowing through our organization to the hospital. Um, we can we can build stories of impact around these. We can use that to um, further steward our donors. Um, and show that we are um, a place to invest their money with. Um, and then thirdly, potentially uh, larger campaigns, the scope and the size of uh, fundraising campaigns, I think are just gonna get bigger and bigger. Um, here, we're just coming, we came out of a $50 million campaign and the next campaign, that um, major campaign that we're looking at is about 500 million. So. We're going to be, um, I think, I think most organizations are going to have to be looking at at um, bigger size and bigger scope. And then question for you both uh, here at AHP, one of the one of the key issues that we continually hear from our members as a challenge is turnover. Uh, we know that the the average tenure of a major gift officer, research has shown, runs about 16 to 18 months, and of course that's often not enough time to build those relationships that lead to transformational gifts. So uh, if we could start back with Scott here, how how do you motivate your team and, and how do you overcome that issue of turnover? <clears throat> uh, yeah, in a small market, it's, it's challenging. So one thing that we're really looking at doing is bringing our mission internal to the organization where, where I think we're very good at bringing our mission externally to the community. Um, But if we bring it internal, I think we can really build a commitment with our staff. We can build connection with our staff um, to the hospital site and to the amazing things that are happening uh, on our site. 
Uh, we're also looking as um, as Joe um, briefly alluded to before about clarity on uh, goal setting and responsibilities, um, better strategic planning, better operational planning, making sure everybody knows how they're contributing to the uh, to the larger mission, to the organizational goals, and that's uh, those are our two main focuses uh, to in the next uh, short term here to to uh, retain our staff members. And Joe, how are you addressing retention? Well, I think that uh, the numbers you quoted are, are very startling in our industry. And, and when you're in a dense market like we are with a number of nonprofit organizations ramping up for a capital campaign or, or uh, a major initiative, uh, the, the pressure on, on hiring good people is, is paramount. So I, I think it really does start, as Scott mentioned, with, with hiring the right people who are tied to your mission. Um, it, there's less of a chance to lose them if they're really passionate about your organization and not just the fundraising job and, and the paycheck. But to, to set realistic goals um, and to uh, also incentivize them to stay through uh, we, we've ad adopted two different programs. One is an incentive pay program uh, that is really tied to the fundraiser's goals, uh, very um, structured metrics for goals and that we set with them. Uh, it, it not only applies to the major gift staff, but also to other fundraisers and support staff in the organization as well. Uh, and then we also have created a, a way for us to identify high performers in our staff and to uh, move them up in, in uh, responsibility so that they're not looking at that next opportunity outside our organization, that we have opportunities within the organization for them to move from a, a development officer to an assistant director, to a director, to an executive director. Uh, those are very key uh, steps in the development officer's career. So I'd rather them, if they're good, to have them make those steps here, uh, build those relationships, uh, stay for the long term, rather than leave and go uh, down the road to another organization to get that promotion, that new title, uh, a little bit more money. Let's see. It doesn't look like I'm seeing any questions that have come in. Mike, is there anything on your end? Yeah, actually, I do have one. Uh, I think it just came in. It was uh, in private. Um, they were asking if Joe could uh, touch on how they continued to successfully fundraise while rumors of a merger before a partner was announced. Yeah, so, rumors, I guess. so, so, um, that's a that's a great question. I I was here when we announced the partner. Uh, there weren't too many rumors about the partner before we made the announcement, uh, but the, there was a long period of time between the announcement of the merger and the actual merger. Uh, so keeping people focused on um, what we were doing, that fundraising was local, that we were raising funds for uh, individual hospitals and, and institutional initiatives. Uh, we, we changed our communication strategy to ramp up and do more uh, communication to our board members and donors and key internal constituents about what we were doing uh, and where the money was being uh, used. And I think that that was actually one of the key things I learned uh, you know, from my university days was that people are um, very tied to their college, their unit, uh, they're very tied to their hospital. So. One of the big questions I always got for the merger came from the doctors, the donors, uh, and, and whatnot, that was my donation going to be used here or somewhere else? And our structure allowed me to say very clearly that the funds we were raising for Hospital A would stay at Hospital A. And then we increased our uh, communication around impact reports so that they could see the money being transferred back and the impact that their donation was making. So we didn't see a drop off in uh, in 2015 when we announced the merger through uh, the next six months and 16 before the merger actually happened. And I and I credit my team for 
um, taking those steps of, of that increased communication. And Mike, are there any other questions in the in the list? Um, I do have an, uh, another one. It's actually just more of a uh, technical one. The, the, there's a person asking how uh, net revenue is defined in the report as opposed to gross revenue. And basically, um, as I was showing on those slides at the beginning, um, we collect revenue based on um, a, a number of different areas for funds raised, plan giving, government grants, special events, corporate fundraising, um, you know, and a major and and annual gifts and so the gross revenue is simply looking at those totals and then the net revenue uh, takes into account fundraising expenses um, either uh, direct uh, indirect or overhead and then we just subtract that number out and let's see um, no I don't I don't see any other additional questions uh, the last one on my list, at least for both uh, Joe and Scott, is uh, how do you use tools like the report on giving benchmarking data uh, in your organizations? And let's start. Uh, let's start with Scott. Sure. We um, we use it in our budget planning process uh, first and foremost. Uh, we use, as I mentioned earlier, the revenue mix of high performers. Um, we also use it in our scorecard um, reporting. So um, in our goal setting and um, we are, um, we're reporting it to our board members uh, as well as to our staff members um, on an ongoing basis, sometime, sometimes monthly, sometimes um, more than monthly. Um, but I would say uh, most of all, we're using it in our in our planning and in our budgeting process. Uh, that's where it really, really uh, comes in handy. I, I would echo that. Sure, I, I would echo that. That uh, in looking at some of the trends, uh, where are we um, underperforming, if you will, uh, in some of these uh, sources of revenue? So, for example. Uh, our annual giving area is at 4%, uh, where uh, other uh, high performers are at 6.3. And so one of the things my uh, annual giving team did was create a survey for some peer institutions to see, one, how they're counting annual gifts. Is it just gifts under $10,000, or is there some other way to count an annual gift? And, and what are we doing differently, uh, maybe, we find out that our 4% is, is actually very good for us. Uh, but, you know, we, we take on that role of, of looking at that and drilling down and seeing if we can learn from, from some others. The other way, as Scott said, you know, sharing it with our board and internal constituents, it's always nice in healthcare to, to show what your return on investment is. Uh, the foundations tend to have the best return on investment of any, uh, any unit at the, in a healthcare. So, uh, I love to be able to talk to them about that and, and advocate for the resources that we need to uh, build on that and uh, take advantage of uh, the wonderful care that our doctors and nurses uh, deliver in the hospitals uh, to raise more philanthropic support so that we could be um, on the cutting edge of, of healthcare and, and medicine. All right. Well, uh, Joe and Scott, thank you both for your time uh, and your, your expertise on this webinar. Um, and Mike, if you could flip to the next slide, we'll uh, wind things down here. Sure. For those who, uh, if you'd like to learn more about the AHP High Performers, uh, if you're coming to the International Conference in a couple of weeks in San Diego, we'll have a panel of high performers uh, during the breakfast session on Friday the 19th. We have two more webinars left in the year, one in November and one in December. Uh, both are about how to use the benchmarking data with your boards, your donors, the C-suite, uh, and other constituencies. However, each of the webinars will approach it from a different perspective. Uh, so the November webinar takes a strategic look at the topic. We'll be joined by two chief development officers sharing their experience using data on that webinar. On the December one, uh, we'll be joined by three uh, directors of operations, looking at how the data can help you from a, an operational 
and back office perspective. Uh, and Mike, one more slide. Oh, I'm sorry. No problem, thanks. Uh, we also wanted to, to give you our contact information. Um, if you have any questions about the report on giving, uh, benchmarking subscriptions, or want to participate in the survey, feel free to contact myself or Jasmine Jones at AHP or Mike uh, at ARI. So thanks uh, to our panelists and to everyone who joined today. We again apologize for the technical difficulties, but hope you were able to find some value in the webinar. So thanks again, and that concludes our presentation for today. Thank you. Thank you.